Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the City Council. It's glad, I'm glad to have you all here on this beautiful Thursday morning. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson of District 16 in the Bronx, and I'm proud to serve as the chair of the subcommittee on the capital budget here in the New York City Council. And I'm thankful to be here this morning to discuss the Department of Design and Construction's front end planning unit. As many of you know, DDC plays an essential role in our city's capital construction process. As the city's primary capital construction project manager, DDC is responsible for the overall design, the construction, and the overall coordination of capital projects citywide and is currently managing over 3,883 agency projects to be exact. DDC provides communities with new or renovated structures such as firehouses, our libraries, police precincts, courthouses, senior centers, children's museums, to be exact, while working collaboratively with other city agencies and many external partners. The front end planning unit was first established by DDC in 2016 to perform an early review of project proposals with sponsoring agencies and to ensure that goals and budgets and scopes and schedules were all aligned. The idea was that the front end planning unit would help agencies understand exactly what they were asking for and how much it would cost before, before pursuing projects with the end goal of being able to complete projects on time and within budget. This was a key change to the city's capital projects process. In January of this year, DDC released its strategic blueprint for construction excellence that everyone has, in which outlined its plan to transform how city agencies managed capital construction projects from start to finish in order to deliver public buildings and infrastructure on time and on budget. The strategic blueprint outlined several significant changes, one of which included the expansion of the front end planning unit. As many of our city's buildings and infrastructure reach their maturity, it seems increasingly more important to incorporate front end planning to more of our city's projects. At this morning's hearing, we look forward to learning more about the work of the front end planning unit, what's working, what can be improved, whether it's having the desired effects and goals, and whether there is sufficient headcount and budget. We hope to hear more from DDC about the work to further expand the front end planning unit and how such improvements will streamline the construction pipeline and the review process to effectively scope and budget city capital projects. Before I conclude my opening, I wanna thank the staff who helped prepare for this hearing this morning, and I'd like to thank the Finance Division and our subcommittee staff. Our Deputy Director, Nathan Told, our Unit Head, Chima Obichair, our Financial Analyst, Monica Bujak, our Senior Counsel, Rebecca Chasen, as well as our Assistant Counsel, Stephanie Ruiz. Thank you to this team for putting today's hearing together. I'd also like to acknowledge the members of the committee who are here, and we will be joined by other members throughout the morning. We have with us our minority leader, Council Member Steve Matteo is here. And we will hear this morning from Andrew Halweck, DDC's Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs, as well as Eric Borstein, our Associate Commissioner for Architecture and Engineering and Technical Services. And I do want to express my gratitude over the past year and a half that I've chaired this subcommittee. We've worked very, very closely with uh, our commissioner, Ms. Grillo, uh, and her team um, as the strategic blueprint was released. And one of the projects that obviously is in my backyard that I speak so lovingly about is the Bronx Children's Museum. And I am just so excited that in 2020, the county of the Bronx will finally have a children's museum. And DDC is going to make that happen. Uh, we've had a lot of hurdles, a lot of challenges, but we are going to see that project 
to fruition. And I'm very, very proud that DDC is leading it. And I want to thank you on behalf of the Bronx because it's important to all of us for our children to have their own children's museum. Right now we have a mobile bus that travels around the Bronx. And would you believe the bus is breaking down? So we are replacing the bus, but we're not delaying the opening of the Children's Museum. So I want to thank DDC as well as our uh, commissioner, Lorraine Grillo, and thank you for being here. And now I will have our council swear you in, and then you can begin your testimony. Thank you for joining us today. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, Chair Gibson and uh, Council Member Matteo and members of the subcommittee on ca the capital budget. My name is Andrew Hulwick, Deputy Commissioner for Communications and Policy at the New York City Department of Design and Construction. Uh, as, you, as you've mentioned, I'm joined at the table this morning by Associate Commissioner of Architecture and Engineering, Eric Borston, and we have several of our DDC colleagues in the audience who will be here to uh, help answer any, any detailed questions you may have. Uh, I'm pleased to discuss in detail our front end planning units, uh, perhaps excruciating detail, but we want to we be uh, transparent uh, and, and make this a dialogue uh, with the Council. And more broadly, the great progress DDC has made in the recent past to streamline the capital construction process under the leadership of Commissioner Lorraine Grillo. Completing capital projects in a dense, aging urban environment that is both highly regulated and closely scrutinized is challenging. A re recently released blueprint for construction excellence details the risks related to a constrained design, bid, build, procurement model, a multi-tiered oversight structure, dozens, literally dozens of interagency relationships, and successfully managing hundreds of consultants and contractors while working to complete work on a $2 billion portfolio. This, by the way, is not an excuse, but rather the backdrop to guide our solutions. In 2016, based on the advocacy of elected officials in this room and others on the Council, front-end planning was created to develop a comprehensive understanding of the needs of each capital project, no matter how large or how small, to facilitate successful delivery in a safe, expeditious, and cost-effective way. Our FEP units work closely with sponsor agencies on every single project submission to clearly understand project scopes and ensure enough funding is in place up front. This is limited last minute changes and advanced project initiation more quickly. This also decreases future delays in design and construction as sponsor agencies must approve and sign off on FP FEP's findings before project initiation. Our FEP process puts projects on a better path for long term success. One of the key long standing challenges has been improving the initial level of details of projects submitted to DDC for construction. For some time, the sponsor agencies for whom DDC builds were required simply to submit a project initiation form with limited detail, with a budget to DDC, and the project immediately became DDC's, and the clock on the project started to tick. Today, once we come to an agreement with our sponsor agency on a project scope, and there is enough funding provided, then and only then will DDC officially accept it through the uniform ele electronic capital project initiation process, another innovation that came uh, after the uh, uh, release of our blueprint in January. Since we have established this thorough proposal review process, we have been able to work closely with the Office of Management and Budget to use FEP's final report as the official request for the certificate to proceed provided, by M uh, provided to M OMB. This has reduced the time between FVP's work with the sponsor agency and DDC's approval of the project from 15 months to nine, a substantial reduction in the initial procurement process and uh, allowing us to jump into, into design more quickly, adding a level of certainty I think that uh, really I think can reassure uh, uh, project owners and people who are invested in those projects. The intensive pre-approval engagement has significantly enhanced communication between DDC and sponsor agencies prior to project acceptance and has led to a number of uh, PIs being returned for further review. In fiscal 2019, DDC Public Buildings FEP reviewed 97 projects, 51 or 53 percent of which were returned for further consultation. 
Generally, PIs were returned for further review due to constructability issues that might impact the true scope and true cost of the project, the need for additional funding to complete the proposed project, and or a need to further differentiate between capital and expense items in the scope. A, a real bugbear of, of many capital projects and the one we're able to differentiate at the front again with this process. Returning the PI to the sponsor does not mean rejection, to be clear. It simply ensures that scope and budget must be in alignment before both DDC and the sponsor undertake costly public work. The FVP staff work tirelessly with sponsor agencies and collaboratively to ensure projects come to fruition via a host of resources at DDC's disposal, including in-house cost estimating services, site visits, and follow-up meetings. To reiterate, every project goes through FVP before it is officially accepted. The time between F uh, PI form submission and the start of design can uh, take approximately seven to nine months through a series of phases involving, involving multiple units within DDC in addition to FEP. And here's where we get a little detailed. Phase A, and this, this is, uh, uh, you can sort of follow this on, on the chart. Um, phase A consists of an initial assessment, scope, scope development, and feedback to the sponsor agency. Phase B details project schedule, utilizes our in-house cost estimation services, identifies all required regulatory approvals, of which we know there are many, and professional services that will be needed and require and requires an additional agency uh, review of FEP's findings. Together, phases A and B are known as the planning phase and encompass the bulk of FEP's process. These phases typically take several weeks. The final deliverable of the uh, project planning process is the FEP report, which details the proposed scope of work. It's a, it's a really elaborate document, which I hope we can share with you. If not at this juncture, we have we can. Uh, it's 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 a robust document, uh, which details the proposed scope of work, project background, and zoning information, applicable zoning laws, photos after the site visit, the project schedule, and the project budget. The sponsor agency receives the FEP report, which includes DDC's findings and recommendations. If DDC has recommended the project for initiation, the sponsor may approve the FEP report and conclusions via a signed PI form. Alternatively, the sponsor may express concerns or comments with either of these documents and further discussion ensues. Once approved, a managing agency switch occurs and the project is initiated by DDC. The clock has started. If DDC has not recommended the project for initiation, DDC provides the sponsor with the decision accompanied by the FEP report and offers the sponsor a meeting to discuss our recommendations and to collaborate further. The sponsor may, th may then take the recommended changes to resubmit the PI form for review. And this is also a successful process in many cases, mm -hmm. uh, including in uh, uh, you know, the Queens Library projects have uh, 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 I think have a, a, a much better track record thanks to this process. The expansion of FEP is one of a larger set of structural changes happening at DDC under Commissioner Grillo to improve capital project delivery. In January, we released our strategic blueprint for construction excellence, an agency-wide review of business practices and external challenges to build infrastructure and public works more efficiently and cost-effectively. While many of the recommendations are technical, the ultimate objectives are no less important, ensuring the collective quality of life for all New Yorkers. The, the blueprint contains detailed solutions to bureaucratic inefficiencies identified by practitioners and supported by stakeholders who work with and depend on DDC, and demonstrates how we can, in fact, untangle complicated uh, the government processes and change them for the better. We're essentially reverse engineering this process and looking very carefully at how all these processes can be untangled. Although not the subject of today's hearing, let me briefly highlight the blueprint's objectives. First, at the front, we want to improve the pipeline. In addition to our front end planning units, DDC is also expanding several services to further assist agencies with their scope development, including cost estimating uh, services and DDC-led CPSD studies, as well as a new and this is critical, and I hope we can discuss this further, advanced capital planning unit that will assist agencies in their planning assessments well in advance of proposed capital work. DDC is committed to managing projects more effectively to remain a best-in-class provider of construction services. Two new initiatives underway since January are the implementation of a multi-day project manager training and certification for all of our frontline project managers. 
giving them the sense of ownership over their projects, which is a critical function in both the public and private sector, really ensuring that this is, uh, th that they own these projects. We've also established an Office of Cost Control, which is another new initiative under the blueprint, whose sole job is to collect data on DDC projects in order to create firm, reliable standard unit costs and design and construction schedules, which I hope we can report on in the future. We are getting more out of designers, contractors, and construction managers by making it easier for all parties to be included in projects via increased MWBE participation, a top priority of Commissioner Grillo and Mayor de Blasio. We are retooling vendor performance evaluation so that we can improve performance without limiting the vendor pool. Another interesting uh, uh, exercise. Finally, DDC is modernizing our internal systems and technology so that we can track key data efficiently, so that flags are raised quickly on pro problematic steps in the process. And there's a further level of accountability, both internally and externally, as we know whose desk a particular review or action is on. DDC provided a six-month update on our strategic blueprint in July, which you also have on your desks, and we'll soon begin working on a one-year update so everyone stays on their toes on this process. The realization of a full-scale front-end planning expansion has provided absolutely essential oversight and process control in the development of viable capital projects. The weeks spent at the outside of a project saved the city vast amounts of time and money over the life of a project. We are proud of these achievements and the implementation of the strategic blueprint. While much work remains, we look forward to continuing to enhance the speed of pr project delivery, decrease costs and safety risks, and bring valuable projects and services to New Yorkers more quickly. Thank you for the, again for the opportunity to testify. My colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, not only your presence here today, but giving us a greater understanding of what uh, the FEP looks like in terms of its internal mechanisms and some of the dynamics of the unit, why it was created in 2016 to begin with, uh, coupled with a progress update. I'm not normally uh, receiving mm -hmm. progress updates after just six months, so I, I think that's very aggressive. Um, so we do appreciate that. Ch uh, uh, Chair Gibson, I just want to say that, that that truly was the at the initiation of, of Commissioner Grillo. This was her idea. Um, and I just want to say because, you know, these things come from the top down. Uh, and we are, as an agency, very much committed to, to following her lead and making sure this, this gets done. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of one of our members of the committee, Council Member Barry Gredenchik. Thank you very much on behalf of Queens. Uh, just a couple of questions and then I'll see if my colleague has uh, anything to add. But you gave us this really nice chronicle of the time frame. And so step by step from phase A to phase B, um, typically what is the average time frame um, in terms of the entire review process in the front end planning unit from beginning to end? Eric, can you? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that one. Um, the process has grown uh, as we've grown our staff and we've grown the, okay. the depth of the service we provide. When we first began the process, it was a little bit more abbreviated than the document you see in front of you. In fiscal 17, the average duration was about 30 days to go through everything. Now, however, it's grown to something like 77 days. That's the average that we're reporting, which includes all the steps that you see here. These are representative of our current process. Again, an enhanced FEP process as described in the blueprint. It's a much more thorough dive into uh, scope, budget, and schedule supported by mem many members of our staff. Okay, it does look very detailed and thorough, and I imagine the idea and the goal is to get, number one, as much information as possible, and that's why we have the preliminary uh, document that agencies have to fill out, which acts for a significant amount of documents. We were briefed on it this week. Um, once you produce the draft FEP report, uh, it goes to the final stage and it's given to the agency. Um, I guess my one of the concerns I have is in that report, I think one of the things where you may have an area of difference is probably the cost, the cost of what it takes to actually fund many of these projects. Um, so once that final uh, FEP is delivered, 
to, sorry, once the final report is delivered from the FEP unit to the agency, once there is any uh, concern or any response, how does the FEP unit work with that particular agency? If it's cost, if it's scope, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems like it could take longer than normal depending on what the report releases and its findings, correct? C correct. I mean, I'll sort of give a, a, a higher level answer and let Eric sort of get to the specific. I think it's really important to understand that, uh, as you pointed out in your opening statement, our job is to serve as the city's really int construction manager from design and construction manager from beginning to end. Uh, that responsibility includes helping uh, our sponsor agencies understand what they need and what they can build and what they can afford. Mm -hmm. And s for, for years, we've sort of accepted their submissions and sort of dealt with it after the fact. What we're doing here at this, at this juncture is a much more robust deep dive with them, helping them understand what they actually have the scope and budget to do. Uh, so we help them define that, and that's a, that's a really important function that uh, we're acknowledging with the creation of front-end planning. That's a good thing. So yes, there are, <laughs> there are discrepancies in what they submit many times and what, and what we tell them they actually need and what the scope they, that they can afford, um, but that's a good thing, right? We've now thought thoroughly about these projects in a way we haven't in the past, and that's our role. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I could if I could add mm -hmm. to that, then sure. um, yeah, very often um, when we submit <clears throat> when we submit the reports back to the sponsor agencies, we are telling them uh, they don't have enough funding in place for the scope of work. Perhaps the scope of work was initially underrepresented, and we've added required work that needs to be done. Perhaps the scope is just fine, but their assumption of what the cost would be is underrepresented. So we're going back to them and saying you need to put more money to this project. It's never good news for an agency to hear that. They have to move money perhaps from other projects to help fund the one that we're talking about. Perhaps they choose not to pursue the project at all because we're telling them it's gonna cost so much more, they're not prepared to spend the money. Um, but the good news is we're telling them that now before anybody has committed anything or spent any money, as Andrew has suggested, in the old days, we would have taken the project, initiated it, started our clock, hired a consultant, started design, start to spend that money, made all kinds of public commitments, and then someone would say, we don't think we have enough money, we have to stop work, or we have to ask for more funds. After we've already spent money, after we've already made commitments, that's a very difficult message to deliver, and it's a very difficult message to receive. We think the value of front-end planning is doing all this work up front, and then helping the sponsor agencies make more informed decisions. If in the end they choose not to pursue a project because we've told them they need to commit more funds, they'll spend that money more wisely on other things. We also go back to them and say, if this is all the money you need to spend, this is your highest priority. Perhaps there are three, four, ten items they initially ask for. We'll say, you can only afford three, and these are the ones that are most critical given the existing conditions of your building. So we think it's good advice at the right time. Again, in the old days, we never did that. We never had the purview to do that. We would jump in, start trying to meet expectations. We'd have commitments made and then discover these problems. Very often, those jobs are the ones that would stop dead in the water, sometimes for years, as people try to decide what to do after we've already spent some of their design funds. So it's a little late to hear that message. We like this much better. I understand. And then you would have very angry elected officials. Mm. Which we don't like either. We don't like either. No. Well, <laughs> again, right. Okay. That, that's a so I think my, many of my colleagues have experienced uh, some of the challenges that you talked about mm -hmm. before the front end planning unit was created. And I understand the goal now is to really shift the dynamics and change that process. And that's a good one. Um, it does make sense. Um, I wonder for many projects where you do submit the final report to a client agency, and particularly if the scope right. needs to be amended, mm -hmm. um, I've had situations where consultants were changed during that process, yes. which yes. caused the price to go up. There were parts of their design and their mechanism that were also changed mm -hmm. during that process. And then more importantly, on our end, as uh, the perspective of elected officials, the cost. So yes. how much time is invested in the front end planning unit to allow these client agencies to figure out the best course of action for them? And then for many of us, if we're talking about money with there are additional funds that are necessary, that doesn't always happen in one fiscal year. Um, and then you could also be talking about a combination of both private 
and public dollars, mm -hmm. and so the time frame is quite different. So in instances like that, and that probably speaks to the percentage from fiscal year 19 where 53% of the projects were returned, mm -hmm. um, I can imagine mm -hmm. some of that was incorporated, but how long do you wait for these client agencies to figure out their best course of action, particularly when it's some of those issues like scope uh, as well as cost where they need to go to outside external sources to acquire mm -hmm. additional funds. So we don't have a lot of insight into that process in the agencies themselves. Um, we'd like to be more helpful if we could and hence okay. we referred to our proposed ACP, Advanced Capital Planning Project or, or program. Um, but the truth is we'll, we'll support the sponsor agencies as long as it takes them to make those decisions. Sometimes we find scope is clear, the budget is pretty good, and there's a shortfall but a diminuous one, and we would expect and we can experience that those projects are resubmitted to us relatively quickly if we're off by 10 percent, 15 percent. As we described in our testimony, the front-end planning report goes to OMB as its basis for the CP request. So mm -hmm. OMB checks to make sure if we say there's a certain amount of money required for the project, they're not going to give us the CP if that money isn't there. If it's a small amount, we expect that the agencies can quickly relocate the funds. Again, from our outside position, we're not internal to that decision-making process. They can do it relatively quickly and we can initiate those projects if we're close. If we're far apart, and sometimes we are, um, many, often, uh, many times those projects don't come back to us at all. We don't know exactly why, but we would assume um, the shortfall is so great they've decided to spend the money on a different project because we don't have a formal mm -hmm. closure process. There's no, and maybe there should be, um, after we've returned the, the uh, front-end planning report to them, they can respond by saying, thank you, we've chosen not to continue with this project. We keep metrics on how long it's been since we've heard last, and if we give you a number like 300, 400, 500 days, it begins to suggest to me that they've reprioritized their needs or are spending that money on something else. We don't know, and so we can't turn off that particular clock. But um, very oftentimes, again, we have some data on this, but we'd rather give you a more detailed report when we have better collection of data and can be more conclusive with that. Um, the range in response times can vary from a couple of weeks, a couple of months, to then, you know, never. Um, which again implies right, that the but they've reallocated right. the funding towards something else. But let me let me intervene a little bit. Um, mo uh, if most of the projects that get through front end planning proceed quickly into design. Many of which, which started in, in 2017, a number of them have actually completed construction. So what we're seeing is that the the the, the front end planning unit has a demonstrated value. In other words, the process the, the projects that have gone through it. Mm -hmm in which the uh, sponsor agencies have chosen to initiate are proceeding at a, at, a, at a more rapid rate, which is a good thing. I think what you're talking about is, is in, in important, but may, may align better with some of these other initiatives that we're talking about, uh, like uh, 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 using uh, CPSD studies, these early capital planning studies, which we're initiating uh, with uh, uh, some of the sponsor agencies. We're doing a lot of reviews with the Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, we're going to initiate a program where we look at their assets before they recommend a project, give them an analysis of what their assets look like, and then they make a decision about what they can afford and what, what is a priority. So this notion that you come to us with something, uh, you know, and then, we, and then w it's almost too late at that point. We should, we, as a city, we should be thinking about very early asset analysis mm -hmm. and looking at those things closely and that's what DDC is, is beginning to do in addition to its front-end planning unit okay. which, which does create that sort of catchment so we don't go too far down the road. <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have data that would look at some of the trends in terms of some of the sponsor agencies that you know you seem to have a good track record of accepting their particular capital projects so I think uh, I've been here six years mm -hmm. and if I look at the total spectrum of capital projects that DDC has managed. Um, one of the projects that you know we do really well are step streets. Mm -hmm. The step streets are completed uh, in mm -hmm. less than two years, um, more like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, it almost seems like they're expedited, but we manage them really well. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also look at you know just hearing from other colleagues where we've struggled over the years, even before the front end planning unit was created with our cultural institutions. 
um, as well as our libraries. So we've had, a par mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll get to parks, uh, where we've had you know projects that are years and years and years, and, and you wonder, what is the delay? And mm -hmm. so I, I guess I ask that question to look at data that you already have, where you're seeing agencies that just seem to do this really well, and then the other agencies that you know need a little bit more assistance. Are you looking at trends based sure. on the data you have? We are looking, and we'll be happy to provide that to you. I, okay. I don't think we can do that at this hearing. Okay. But I, I wouldn't make a... You're raising an important point. Uh, Front-end planning is not the only tool in the toolbox that we need, and I think you're talking about uh, the real, why do projects take so long? Why are they complicated? Well, I think a really important, uh, you know, particularly for public buildings, these sophisticated, complicated buildings, the way the system is designed now, the city has to procure a designer. The designer designs the project. We stop, and then we procure a contractor to look at a completed design, which they've had no input on, and then they offer their lowest responsible bid, mm -hmm. which we're required by law to accept, and we take the lowest bidder, and they're, they're instructed to build that building, which had an estimated cost that they had no input in. The city right now has, which is not efficient and has led to uh, innumerable pro problems, particularly for sophisticated, uh, unique projects like cultural institutions, right, mm -hmm. which are yeah. really supposed to be gems for a, for a community and which by definition are unique and special. And what we're proposing, there's legislation in Albany that's awaiting the governor's signature called Design Build Authorization, which I know you're familiar with, which is mm -hmm. one of a suite, which is just one of a new approach to design and construction that virtually the rest of the world uses to oh, great effect, right. including the state of New York, mm -hmm. to allow us to, to permit the designer and the constructor to talk to one another before they've designed this project so we know what the cost is going to be. We, we're, they're allowed to collaborate. They do, tr they do troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. And what's more, this process allows us to request a guaranteed maximum price. So all these things are submitted in a package which we're able to evaluate. So when we, we proceed, we're much more certain of price, mm -hmm. timeline, and mm -hmm. constructability. Right. And all we're waiting on is the governor's signature for this. But this is just one of a suite. There are other, in our legislative agenda last year, we asked for, you know, not to get too, you know, into the weeds, but there's construction manager at risk, construction manager and build, which are just variations on this concept that these two critical components of the design and construction process, the designer and the constructor, constructor, talk to one another and offer a price so we know what the heck is going on. And mm -hmm. we urge the council <laughs> to continue its strong support of these initiatives so that we can get these tools uh, this year and next year as we go back to Albany. I agree. I hope the governor signs the bill. <laughs> We're waiting. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the rev um, the revised uh, project initiation form, which makes you know things obviously more comprehensive to get all of the additional information. Um, have you received any feedback yet from any of the sponsor agencies on how the form could be improved since you launched it? Has there been any you know dialogue mm -hmm. on the contents of the form? Um. I haven't heard anything specifically about recommendations from the sponsors in terms of the form. Um, okay. You know, the form takes what used to be um, sort of a hand-filled out series of sheets of paper where they would hand write in information. We tried an Excel spreadsheet, and then we got the IT support to actually build a portal. Uh, we've launched the portal uh, live, the FTP LITE light portal, and we're about okay. to roll out the full version once training is complete. We've brought all of the sponsor agencies into our offices to give them training on how the portal works so that they can then uh, uh, enter their information electronically. Um, the full-blown module, once that's live, will give everybody greater insight into the full working process so that anybody involved, be it the FEP staff, be it the sponsor agency or anyone else, can actually get insight into where we are in the process. And so launching software like that, which we developed in-house with our IT department, there have been some setbacks and things that we've been hearing, which you know are not subs uh, substantive, are trouble using the tool, trouble making the, uh, entering the data in a way that then you get the expected results. So we're debugging that. Um, okay. But that's, that's just growing pains, I believe. I think the information is clear. Um, we try to be as specific as we can so that the front-end planning staff has the information. We don't always get 
all the information that's required. Um, and that holds us up. So sometimes a PI mm -hmm. form will come in, and our initial review, if it says um, initial assessment in the first box on this uh, mm -hmm. flowchart, is our, our budget officer will look at it and simply say, there's missing information. We can't accept this yet. Um, as an administrative task, I think that's annoying for everybody, including the sponsors. And so we're looking for you know, a little bit more familiarity, I think, to take, take root before it becomes second nature. Okay, and yeah. understanding it takes mm -hmm. time to transition to a process that sure. agencies are not necessarily used to. And you mm -hmm. indicated that you do provide the training and sufficient yes. materials yes. Um, to allow them a chance to navigate uh, the forum. We do have people available to assist the sponsor agencies as they do this. They can just give us a call. We can have them come in. We can go to them. Our IT people are very much available to help with that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the project initiation form, uh, you also introduced the scope verification report. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask, have you seen any impacts or any results uh, from the institution of this practice so far? Well, we have. The scope verification report is the first time we go back to the sponsor and say, you know, we've looked at what you've told us, uh, we've met on site and spoken with you, um, we've read the report or the scope that you've recommended, and this is our version of what we believe is required, and we send that back to them, uh, recommending that certain things that they may have omitted just from lack of, it, of knowledge need to be included because it'll have a cost impact. Um, sometimes the response from the sponsors is, no, that's not what we want, and we go around another uh, revision to that. More often than not, it's like they understand that this is now a more complete version of the scope, and they can then sign off on that. The scope verification report is the first step. Once we're in agreement on scope, we're aligned with the sponsor on scope, we've all agreed to whatever it is that we recommend needs to be done, we then can develop budget and schedules and consultant fees and that type of work in the, in the so-called phase B on your uh, flow chart. Um, and then that goes to, again, a second opportunity, uh, or I guess a third red box on your sheet where the sponsors, again, get to sign off on our recommendations before we proceed. Yeah. And in terms of when <coughs> the unit presents design options to the client agency itself, mm -hmm. um, informing them of the costs associated uh, with each proposed design, are you finding that there's a lot a lot of pushback sometimes on the actual cost estimates that you're providing where a sponsor agency will say, well, no, we believe that this is the actual cost and here's our data. So is there mm -hmm. that back and forth uh, at times with some of the agencies? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can um, only imagine. <laughs> but, but I want to add, you know, um, we, we alluded to our uh, construction procurement process, a competitive sealed bid process, um, where prices are proposed by contractors on the open market, very much subject to market conditions, to competition, uh, how busy is the general construction industry at large. Um, when we go back to our sponsor agencies and advise them that maybe the project is underfunding, it's in that context that we're advising them. We're not arguing the cost should be lower. We're not arguing that we don't want to bring the jobs in for the prices that they have. They get their information you know, from reliable sources as well. We're reflecting more on our experience in the marketplace in a competitive bid environment, and we base our cost on recent bid results. So if we have comparable projects that are similar in scope or similar in size, we can say, well, we've just bid three of these, and the prices are higher than any of us like, but it is what it is until we have a different procurement methodology in the toolkit. This is what we can expect with your project. We're not saying it's great news, but we're saying it's reality. Or at least it's the reality as far as we can predict it this early in the just, process. Just to, um, it's a great question. So there's two things that we're also trying to do to you know, help solve that problem. Uh, also, as a uh, result of the creation of the blueprint, we've established an office of cost control. That's a new office that did not, I mean, there were other, you know, stop gaps in the, throughout the agency that did cost control, but we have now a dedicated unit whose sole function is really to analyze DDC's historical cost and schedule data to make sure that uh, we fully understand what unit costs are for a certain t uh, type of building, a standard duration, so that we really, really have a much more solid grasp of you know, very standard range of costs and schedules. What's more, <laughs> the standard schedules are not f flying anymore. We are going to establish shorter construction durations, shorter design durations, mm -hmm. than, because these things are unacceptable as they are now. It is, uh, it is a, 
a labor. I'm not saying tomorrow we're going to roll out shorter times and, and budgets, but the answer to, to your question is yes, they should be less, and we're working on a, on a separate initiative, which is included in the blueprint, uh, to, to, to accomplish just that. The Office of Cost Control that you described is a brand new office created, um, but it's not within front-end planning. It's within another part of DDC, but it works closely with FEB? Right. We're, okay. we're not a gigantic, I mean, we're a big agency, but uh, yes, I mean, the, the office is housed on the same floor near where Eric mm -hmm. sits, and they work together. Okay. So I can imagine uh, this unit um, has to work very closely with um, the FEP as it relates to just the cost control and overall cost management and real estimates that are as accurate as can be. Um, how does that unit control some of the variable costs that are not necessarily fixed that are more so market determined? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, well, things you can't really control, even think, though it's cost I control. I think for <laughs> starters, I mean, with, you know, making this sound really terrific, but they, the, the office is only recently been established. I mean, there's a full unit, there, there's staff, there's a director, it's functioning, but I don't think we're at this point where they're sort of making inputs uh, into all of FEP's decisions. I mean, but some of the data they, they use is, is also the data that, that FEP uses, <coughs> but um, I think, you know, the outcomes that we're looking for should be, uh, you know, available, you know, some of the outcomes should be available by the time we report back in January. Oh, okay. Okay, great. In the year report. In the year we'll report. See. Yep. Okay. Um, in the, the six-month blueprint progress update that we have, um, it was announced that we issued a sponsor-initiated change request policy that would really improve the project initiation and limit scope change. Um, can you describe a little bit of the details of, of what this means and, and what you entail as the goal of, it, of this? Um, sort of to back up, I mean, the idea is that when a sponsor signs off on the FEP uh, report, that's it. That's the project. Uh, I think in the past, uh, you know, historically, uh, again, I think Eric, Eric described fairly well that, you know, there would be a budget and a scope. We would accept it and sort of design our way to a project and budget our way to a project after the thing was, was submitted. Now with FEP, they, sub they do this very thorough analysis. They're going to build a box with X uh, uh, components to the box, and it's going to cost X amount. Uh, on the rare occasion that there's, that there's some later s scope change, I think that what we're trying to do is establish some certainty that we understand that this is a change initiated by the sponsor. Um, ultimately, how do we establish the performance measurements of the front-end planning unit? So how do we define success? Is that by the number of projects that we are accepting from the initial stage, or is it how many of the projects were kept within scope, uh, design, budget, and timeline? Uh, and I ask that question because um, many projects go through front end planning, and we want to understand, obviously, some of the best practices, some of the things that are working, but also identifying gaps in services mm -hmm. with a number of the new efforts that you have embarked on. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, with front end planning, since 2016, as we look to receive, which you know you will, mm -hmm. more capital projects. Many mm -hmm. of us have a few years left to go, right. so we're just pushing out capital projects. Amen as much as we can, um, just overall with what the city is doing with resiliency projects. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just so much going on across the city um, to provide more sustainability uh, in a growing city that has to recognize climate change. Yes. So what would you mm -hmm. say are some of the measurements of success for the front end planning unit? Uh, again, that's, that's a great project. I mean, when, as we were preparing for this hearing, I, w w we looked at some of the data from the initial uh, initial uh, uh, couple of years of front-end planning, and uh, uh, most of the projects <laughs> that have proceeded from design uh, from FEP into DDC's pipeline are either uh, proceeding through design, some of them into construction. Uh, so just sort of based on that high-level review, uh, we believe that the, that the process is functioning. Do we, do we have an apples to apples side by side with what we've done in the past? No, but we, we will have metrics, but w the, the program is a little young to be able to really, because mm -hmm. the life of a project, even if you had started a project 
through FEP in fiscal year 2016, even for a standard construction project, that very first tranche of projects would only now sort of be coming to fruition. So we will be measuring it. We don't have like that hard data yet. Okay. And I think I know the answer to this, but yeah. um, within the process within FEP, if there is a change to the price, um, I'm assuming that the sponsor agency has the sole responsibility of identifying those external or internal uh, cost additions. So at any point does DDC say, well, the project is a half a million dollars um, you know, under budget, so we'll do a half and half. You guys do 250, we'll do 250. Does that ever happen or does the agency assume all of the costs? We have no funding. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. I knew the answer, yeah, but I right. just wanted to make sure. <coughs> oh, but also, I would add, council member knows, um, this is where the elected officials come in, right. where we get called by some of the uh, sponsor agencies in terms of some of the cost changes. Uh, I, I, that's, I've been through that a few times, so I, I certainly understand how that process happens. So I wanted to ask a question, um, and this is probably important for the electeds to understand as well with DDC, the community and the external input. Right, so many of the projects you're managing are infrastructure, they're step streets, they're building facades. So the New Yorkers that live in these communities have to live through the construction, right? Um, so over the course of, of my tenure here, we've talked a lot about the interagency coordination, particularly with utility companies um, as they get necessary building and other permits. Um, but I wanted to understand what that looks like on the ground. Um, many of the projects go through an extensive community input process, mm -hmm. like as an example, the Parks Department. When we, we, even before we get to design, we have extensive meetings on the ground to talk about what a design looks like. And recognizing that as much input we want from the local residents, we can't get everything we want. And so Parks, as an example, has now started to use a standardized design process mm -hmm. to give them a little bit of a layer so that residents can understand, well, this is where we can start without putting everything into an actual design. Um, so between that, going through the extensive community input process and where the final product should adhere closely as possible to the community's um, wishes. So as I mentioned, Parks Department, another example for us are the participatory budgeting capital projects that we have. So do you know how the front end planning unit approaches these specific types of projects, particularly where there is less flexibility in the design options? Um, is it often that you align the scope with the actual budget? Um, and not just parks as an right. example. I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> uh, this may be an unsatisfactory answer, but I'm going to answer it in a different way. Okay. Um, uh, as it happens, uh, you know, particularly for our, uh, our public plaza projects that we build on behalf of oh, yeah. uh, DEP mm -hmm. uh, and DOT, uh, we're trying to establish a very rigorous collaboration, which is underway. In fact, we're meeting with SBS and DOT later this afternoon to discuss this in, in more detail. Um, how we ensure that uh, the bid, who will ultimately, or the or the or the, the community entity that will manage the plaza, is a participant alongside the community board with the design of that project, mm -hmm. and, and particularly for infrastructure pro uh, projects, DDC has long had a very sort of comprehensive communication with uh, the community uh, board with generally via mail, but uh, presentations of design. So there's a, there's a really lengthy consultation. After a project leaves, sort of, you have a generic scope and a generic budget that you've established through some basic unit cost understanding, some basic, you know, sort of, sort of larger, sort of big picture assessments of the project. But when you, when you get down to the nitty gritty, the actual design, I think DDC is, you know, is kind of proud of its con consultative mm -hmm. process, which we've done, which is, I uh, just want to acknowledge J Jeff Margolis in the office who really, you know, you go out, you talk to the community about what you want, you bring the designer, you bring a, a PowerPoint months and years before that project is underway. So uh, I think that's something we do pretty uh, uh, effectively. But that, that does come after the FEP process. Okay. And is it DDC's responsibility to do the external communications with the stakeholders or do you leave that to the sponsor agency? Um, that's a... Another excellent <laughs> question. 
Um, and something, you know, we're, you know, since I've arrived at, at DDC and the commissioners arrived at DDC, uh, we're, we're definitely trying to calibrate. Uh, we are the designer and the constructor of projects uh, on behalf of sponsors who really define sort of the mission of their agency. So we're trying to become a much more collaborative partner with our sponsors mm -hmm. to make sure that the community understands that you know, a sewer project is part of a larger drainage plan, a street improvement right. project is part of a larger uh, vision for, for the city's uh, transportation network. And what we're supposed to come out and do is really help them think about sort of the nuts and bolts of the design, the nuts and bolts of the process, make sure that any problems that arise during construction are taken care of immediately. Okay. So I can think of one example of a project that turned out really well. There were some hitches and delays. The Roberto Clemente Plaza in the Bronx yes. uh, by the Hub. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. Yep. It's absolutely beautiful. It Thank took you. us a while to get there. Yes. But, and I don't know if the sponsor agency, I'm assuming it was DOT. Yes. I think. Okay. Yeah, that was a, a really good um, process. I mean, it, it, as I mentioned, it was right. some hitches, but... Um, that is sort of the poster child uh, for the, the type of process we're trying to sort of reconstruct. Okay, I understand. Um, that, again, that happened before there was an FEP mm -hmm, process. Mm -hmm. That happened before we have this, we're having this really intensive and, and to my mind, underreported collaboration with uh, bid organizations, DOT, SBS, and DDC, to really make sure that, that we avoid that. And I... I you could go in chapter and verse, you know, who didn't do what, who did what. The outcome was magnificent, mm -hmm. and it's a great right. public amenity. It just mm -hmm. kind of hurt getting there. And we, we know that we can avoid that, but we just have to communicate as with our sponsor agencies, and w I assure you that we're doing that. And I'm happy to walk you through that process as well, not here, but w yes, it's, okay. it's important. It needs to change, and we're working on it. Okay, and then keeping in line with just the uh, community and external input, uh, I mentioned utility companies. Um, I think every member of the council, generally, I'm sure you as well, uh, get frustrated with the uh, Con Edison and just the interagency coordination of utility companies because a lot of times on the ground, those are the individuals you see. And we don't, you know, we don't want to yell at the workers, it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. However, um, when projects are started, is it the front end planning unit that coordinates that um, with the utility companies or do you leave that to the sponsor agency? And then the, during the duration right. of construction, right? right um, how does that work in terms of communication? And then the final part of this is as we end, we need to make sure that these utility companies fix the work that they have done and clean up after themselves so we know that they were not even there. Um, beyond frustrating, and it's not, you know, utility companies generally, I mean, I'm not calling out names, but there's been a growing concern. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Not too many to call out. But it's frustrating just on the ground to see that and experience it and live it. So uh, what does the front end planning unit do as it relates to that external uh, re coordination with utility companies? Um, again, um, not to steal front end planning, Sunder, they, they, they have a very, fortunately for us, they have a defined task, right? Okay. It's to, to say yes or no to a project so a sponsor knows where they have a scope and budget. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, it goes to a design team. Mm -hmm. uh, for infrastructure projects, generally that happens in-house, and there's a, a, a long-standing acknowledgement that our relationship with uh, the utilities needs to change, the communication needs to improve, uh, the timing and sequencing of when they get in, move their utility so that we can proceed with our work happens seamlessly. Mm -hmm. It's easier said than done, but I want you, I want to just make it clear that this is a top priority, not just of DDC, Commissioner Grillo, but the mayor's office is leading a, a task force about utility coordination. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, listen, the proof is in the pudding, right? Mm -hmm. But everyone's on notice, and we are thinking about, the, the, I don't want to say the most radical ways to deal with this, but w w it needs to change. We, we recognize that. I think we have, you know, I think the, our utilities are trying to be honest brokers about this. We're trying to get there. Um, you know, one, 
one effort we're undertaking is a sort of a more thoroughgoing go joint bidding process so that uh, utility relocation uh, and our construction can sort of happen sort of under the same umbrella instead of, again, the sequence thing where the utility comes in and moves and then we move in. The joint bidding sort of blends that because uh, it's either the same contract or it's under the same sort of umbrella. Okay. Uh, that's one effort. But really, the most important thing is understanding our schedule and, 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 the, and the utilities responding to our schedules okay. more efficiently. Um, at what point or what part of the process, if it's not front-end planning, what unit handles the field offices that are usually on the ground? Does every capital project the DDC manages have an actual field office, or is it based oh, yes. on? Oh, that yeah. is the case. Yeah, of course. Okay. There's a, there's a, there's a, every every single DDC project has a resident field engineer okay. who is on site managing that specific project. Okay, okay, uh, very And it's good. it's fully staffed. There should be a community construction liaison to interact with your offices. There should be an engineer is coordinating with DDC and the utility to do that. Okay, great. So I, I was saying to one of your staff, those are the emails I get weekly. Yes. Mm -hmm. on a couple well, thank of goodness you're getting them. DDC projects. Yes, I do good. get them. Um, I wanted to ask a question about budget. I, I certainly um, have to mention the budget just because we are in the business of trying to obviously save money, operate more effectively and efficiently um, on time, and we obviously can't talk about that without talking about the budget. Um, and in every year since the inception of the front end planning unit, uh, DDC has not spent its entire budget, both PS as well as OTPS. So I wanted to understand if there was um, some idea or reasoning behind that, um, why DDC hasn't been able to spend all of the budgeted funds um, for the unit, and do you anticipate having this same issue um, in fiscal 2020? Uh, specific to FEP? Yes. I'll let mm -hmm. Eric answer that. Well, we're trying to catch up on the payroll, on the PS budget. We, we okay. know there are vacancies. We have a certain number of lines approved by OMB. Um, most of those lines are, are being actively uh, pursued. We have interviews going on this very week. Uh, we have a few candidates identified to onboard them through the hiring process. Um, so we're always looking to fill those, those, those heads. Um, it's, okay. it's an ongoing process. We've had a number of separations, which sets us back at the same time. So the net number is sometimes a little bit lower than it might be in terms of the number of people who have come on board, you know, undermined by the people who have left. Um, you had interviews this week, preparing for this hearing and interviewing potential new staff members, and I know you, you've been doing that too. So we're very much okay. trying to do that. The OTPS budget for FEP includes things like a budget for probes. So if we need to go out there and develop our scope and our budget projections to advise our sponsor agencies what probable costs will be, if there are concealed conditions that could be instrumental in impacting both budget and, and schedule, we have a small budget that we've been trying to utilize to have a contractor out in the field, um, open up some masonry walls, dig a test pit, whatever it might be, to expose what would otherwise be an unknown and hidden field condition. Um, and so that was the first year we've ever had that. And again, we're struggling to find the most efficient way to utilize that funding by bringing contractors on board. Um, but those are useful tools for us. So we're looking to make better use of them as we get more and more up to speed. Okay, mm -hmm. so the budgeted headcount increased by 12 positions this year. Yes. So those are the positions that you're looking to staff up um, and get to, to full full staff? Well, the answer is yes, um, but sort of just to refine that a little bit, to be clear, um, uh, the front-end planning unit's headcount is, I believe, at 10, and they're seeking to get to 15 headcount. Okay. Uh, there's additional headcount for the infrastructure FEP unit, whose uh, uh, review durations are already uh, considerably shorter just due to the nature of uh, the, the sponsor agencies that they work with again and again and again, so it you know, sort okay. of makes the process a little shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, and third, uh, uh, some of that headcount uh, we believe will ultimately be dedicated to an advanced capital planning unit, which is oh, critical. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's and that's, a, again, it's, you know, this isn't about the AC, the ACP unit, which doesn't exist right now, but uh, th this is a lot of fun, right? We get it. We really get to think about sort of our capital program before we've, you know, decided to mm -hmm. do something, that, that, that advanced planning, which is so critical. Okay, great. Um, I want to acknowledge we've also been joined by another member of our committee uh, from the Bronx, uh, Councilmember, Councilmember Mark Joni. And I just have to step out for about 10 minutes, so I'm going to um, ask my colleague from Queens to uh, continue with the hearing. I know there are a number of questions. He's getting ready. Um, so I turn this over to Councilmember uh, Barry Gudenchik. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair Gibson. Um, good morning. Good morning. Um, you have a question, Councilman? Thank you, uh, colleague. Okay. For the, uh, uh, Don't take more than nine minutes because I, you know, I want to start asking my questions before the chair gets back. It's a simple <laughs> point that I want to make, and okay. um, one that all of us have experienced in one point or another in our careers. When we put in for a funding and something as small as a park, and we're given a dollar amount for the capital project, and the limited dollar amount dollars that we have are appropriated to that project. Mm -hmm something of high demand and much need and long anticipated and awaited by the community to only find out that the dollar amount that we were given that we fully funded is not adequate enough that would require additional funding. Then begins the cycle and the cycle is we have to wait till the next budget to allocate that money based on the information that we're given as the revised capital needs. When we allocate that funding, we find out that the price has gone up again, and by the time the bids have come in, that we have to allocate additional funding. And it's a like groundhog day all over again. And projects go on for years as we allocate our very limited funding available to capital projects to find out that it takes some of our members have put in for capital projects when they first walked into office and by the time they got out eight years later the project has never been a shovel in the ground it's a disservice to the community it's a disservice to the elected and the whole process and if we can come up with a way to address this issue, and I think the, the, the most famous of them all is the library project. That Which one? The one there's, in, there's numerous ones to cite. The, the one in Queens that our colleague has started open, over open, 10 years ago. That there's three in Queens that have taken, there was the one that opened this week, uh, Rego Park, one, which is years, still waiting, correct? waiting on Rego Park and Far Rockaway also. And mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll just paint a picture of right. when we go out there and we do these incredible uh, announcements that are received with applause and sometimes even tears. We look like we've deceived the public. So what are we going are we to doing? do to change this? Council member, uh, you know, before you uh, arrived, I, you know, I spent a lot of time you know, talking about how we're trying to improve the process. Um, but the other piece of this, uh, I think you articulated perfectly <laughs> is that on the other side of this there's a, a, a people who have invested their time emotions their money their political capital all the things that make the city function and they hand off this project with the expectations that the thing is going to get done <laughs> and it takes it too long and it's it, it 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 doesn't do the city any good because it, it People lose faith in government. They don't think that we have the, the capacity to do these things. Our answer, in part, is that we have created a unit so that that does not happen. The front end planning unit is working with the Queens Public Library and telling them, this is what you can do. This is the box you can build. It can be a, a beautiful box. It can continue to be a beautiful box. This is the money you have to do it with or the money that you will need so that within 70 days or 80 days, they know. And this is a new unit. We have some anecdotes with, with libraries that did not go through that process with QPL, which have subsequently gone through and then have sub subsequently gone into design. Thanks to the creation of the front end planning unit. Now, have we solved every problem with front end planning? No. What we still have <laughs> is this design bid build process which drags this process out much longer than it should be. I alluded before you arrived to the legislation in Albany seeking authority to use design build construction methods so that the designer and the contractor are procured at the exact same time, eliminating a year of procurement like that. 
so that this thing gets done. We're waiting for the governor's signature. You've got a partner here. I'm all in with you. Good. Let's get this thing done. And Good. I'm going to rely on my colleagues Thank in, you. in the city to help put the pressure on Albany to finally deliver this we, much we needed beg, design bill. We beg your that support. That makes sense, and yep. it saves taxpayer dollars right. and time. Thank you. Thank we you. all support Thank design you. build. I, I, we've seen it work um, on the Kosciuszko Bridge, yes. mm -hmm. although I will remind people that it took decades to get to the point where we funded the, you know, that things take time because there are priorities, so. Yes, mm -hmm. but I think you see under uh, strong leadership when someone says get something done. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, that's and, that's, sure. and that's where we are with. And we have seen differences in, in projects in my neighborhood and, and other neighborhoods mm -hmm. around the city. Um, tomorrow is my 32nd anniversary, my start in government. And I will say that over that time, things have certainly improved with, uh, in terms of uh, relationships between um, construction managers out in the field and my office at least. I know we ha we've had uh, good relationships. Um, uh, we were able to get answers much more quickly than uh, th th there were no, it was, it, was, it was difficult back 30 years ago. Um, today, it's a lot easier. If I have to, I can even go out to the project and find somebody, although I don't think it's ever come to that. Um, you mentioned design build, uh, Commissioner, and you, um, it gets us like a year, it's like pole vaults us a year ahead just, just like that. Just in the procurement side, but also on the, the delivery side, because you're delivering a project that you have much more certainty about uh, its schedule and its constructability. Something that you don't have, which is project is designed, stop, and then the construction is procured, and then the, the constructor has to look, examine the design documents to see what is feasible and what isn't feasible. Are we using design build at SCA now? Is that? No. They no. need, they, I mean, uh, is it yes or uh, no? soon I will be sharing uh, a document about the, the dozens of things that the school construction authority is able to do that the right, de know, Department of Design that. and Construction cannot. Uh, we understand that, right. and uh, the, the I was just w wondering yeah. um, about that. Okay, yep. so they don't have it yet, um, and they've got lots of other tools. They have the a lot of other tools, yep. and we work mm -hmm. very closely with Commissioner Grillo yep. on that, and we we uh, have great affection and respect for her. Um, you have in your I was reading through this. You have in your brochure the 116 precinct, but it's not in my district, but while that's true, I am uh, very interested in the project and been a big supporter. It will be in Councilman Richards' uh, district in Rosedale, and I see the mock-up. I see the American flag with the wind blowing east, which is unusual. It's usually blowing in the other direction in that <laughs> neighborhood, but that's okay. Right. Um, yeah. You didn't catch yeah. that. The, the question I have for you, um, with this, I know that the 116 has moved along rather quickly. Yep. Um, not as quickly as I'd like. I, I guess the mayor announced funding for that soon after I got to the council, like three and a half years ago. So, right. was, so that'll give you some idea. There's a timeline, and that's a project that has moved quickly. Um, right. First, we had to find a location. So there are a lot of steps that go well beyond what even the DDC is able to accomplish. Correct. And, uh, uh, but we're, we're, we're designing and constructing that under Kind of existing rules, pre-front end planning, right. uh, we are procuring construction for that project as we speak. So there should be a shovel in the ground. Yeah, I'm looking for, I've, yeah. I've heard that uh, yeah. through the grapevine, yeah. and uh, Councilman Richards is uh, feeling really good uh, about and that. And, uh, yeah, when the, the, when, the, when the mayor tells you to do something, you, you know, you make sure it gets yes, done. Yes, I, and we I always uh, usually follow what he wants, yeah. but not always, but yeah. usually. Um, my question for you is to follow up on uh, something that Councilman Joe and I just talked about. Um, I can make a deal with a handshake with the School Construction Authority because we have, you know, projects that fall short of funding there as well. It's not just DDZ, DDC with design projects. But um, I promise them that I'm going to fund it in the next cycle and they go ahead and start the process, which is not the case with anything that the city does outside of SCA. And it can be extremely frustrating. Uh, we do not, I'm looking at Mr. Toth, we do not do the, uh, capital budget mods during the year here. Um, the mayor's right. office can do that, we don't. Um, I'm correct with that, Mr. Toth, that the mayor's office can do that? Yeah, uh, at the request of the mayor, right. normally, but not exactly. Okay, okay, so, but the mayor has a lot more funds at his 
or her discretion um, to do that with. So one of the ideas that uh, I have mentioned this before to some of the commissioners and, and some of my colleagues and I have discussed it, um, without putting you under too much pressure, um, would it be advisable that there would be a fund to kind of like, it would almost be like the mortar to the bricks where you're a hundred thousand dollars short or two, half a million dollars short on a major project mm -hmm. and at the discretion of the commissioner and with the approval of the council, we'd be able to move those projects along without having to wait a full budget cycle. Do you think that would, uh, couldn't hurt, right? I, I mean, that's a, a sort of an anecdotal question, so I, I, I couldn't give you this, a, a specific answer to it. I will say that the School Construction Authority, the way, uh, and, and I'm sure Council uh, Finance staff can, can give you chapter and verse about it, but they have a lot more flexibility in how funds are, uh, you know, sort of moved, and it's, again, because they're an authority, because right. of their relationship to their oversights, they're able to do things more efficiently. Yes, it would be a good idea. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, with, with, you know, I mean, because a lot of... But, I, listen, I can't, uh, and before I, you know, get into the hot water... Don't get know, in the hot water. Th I'm already in hot water. But, you know, this is, this is a conversation that we need to have with the Office of Management and Budget, which is the custodian of a, a, a budget of tens and tens of billions of dollars, um, and, and which they are... <laughs> Well, their They're job, the fiduciaries with all for due that. respect, yeah. and I, I know people from the mayor's office are here this morning, yeah. their, their job is to make sure we don't spend money, um, even though we know, of course, we have to spend money. They want us to spend as little as possible because they're under tremendous pressure, whereas we want to spend where, you know, we want to build stuff and we want or we want to update stuff, which some of which is incredibly critical to um, the city's life, like sewers and water mains, and they are about the unsexiest projects there are. But without a sewer system, the city would stop in it right. faster than that. You know. Well, I mean, you're talking to infrastructure people. This stuff is sexy to us. Okay. <laughs> and 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 I'm I, I I'm not being facetious. This is this is the this is really important stuff. Oh no, it, it is. And I know this. It, it yeah. you yeah. know to me. I mean you know, yeah. DAP. If you're listening, the uh, yeah. water main break on 73rd Avenue, 210 Street still hasn't been looked at, but. Um, it's, it's parks, it's libraries, that kind of stuff, schools, um, playgrounds, whatever you have. And, um, it takes a time, but I, I, um, I just think that that fund or, you know, the thought of it, and I'll be talking more with, um, Danny Drum about that, um, and, and the speaker, and, and hopefully we can get some movement on right. that. I, um, again, w without opining on sort of, sort of, uh, you know, budget issues, um, what, what we are proposing in our blueprint is increased flexibility, and there, there are multiple ways to do that. I think it is important. Um, I really think it is important because I, I look uh, from time to time at Parks Department. They now, uh, they've put, uh, as of this summer, their bids online. Mm -hmm. So it's fascinating um, to see projects where, you know, they're a little bit over. You know, sometimes it's 50 or 100,000, and sometimes... There was one project in the Bronx somewhere. It was like 47% over. It was expected to be 10 million. It was closer to 15 million, and and that is really. Right. Um, I, I imagine that happens also on 100 million or billion dollar projects as well. Correct. Um, yeah. and w a, a, an initiative we're undertaking, not to not to, you know, beat a dead horse here, is that we are trying to have a much better understanding of the true cost and the true schedule with our off through our Office of Cost Control so that, you know, I think a, a better example is a project that, you know, we estimate at, you know, five million that comes in substantially higher, which is not, uh, you know, a marginal uh, 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 issue. And we, ha we have to understand why that is and fix that so that we don't, you know, we can sort of beat you to that question before, before we get to it. Yeah, it's, it's, well, listen, it's frustrating. I, I know the economy is booming in New York City, and there's, you know, everywhere we look, there are cranes building, and it's sometimes hard. You know, I've had this conversation with, with Therese Braddock and others at Parks, and mm -hmm. it's hard to find contractors or responsible contractors. And, and that's, we've talked about what happens after the contract is going, and I had a, a major issue in Bayside Hills, which was resolved quickly, where the, the contractor went belly up on that, um, water main project, and mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, within a month, we were able to replace them. But that's unusual in itself. So, all kinds of stuff happens, and I know it keeps you all busy. 
Um, I don't know if the chair had other questions for the panel. I think so. All right. Um, let me see. Is there anything else I've scribbled down here that I haven't read yet? Um, this the front end playing. My last question: Does that cover any? I mean, your your projects go from under a million to billions, so it covers everything. Everything. Okay. So every single project. That's good. All That's of good them. To hear. All and right. I, it w again, as we were preparing for this hearing, you know, a point we wanted to make is um, no project. Is 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 missed, and and I think council council members who are responsible for, for funding maybe perhaps what we would call smaller projects, maybe smaller budget projects, get the same attention, the same full review that any other project does. We we consider every project important. Well, I'm looking forward to working with you on a new uh, education visitor center at the Queens County Farm Museum. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, I don't know if you still take your children there, Commissioner, right. but <laughs> the good news is the Commissioner been the, there. the OMB Director is very familiar yeah. with it, so I'm, I'm excited. But we have $9.5 million. This is not a commercial, by the way. I just <laughs> want to make that clear. But <laughs> we do have $9.5 million in funding, and um, I think for the first phase we need a million or two more, and I'll, I'm hopeful that we'll get that very soon. Um, and then if we could do both phases at once, that would be... Council member, we'd be very happy to work with you as early as you like to begin help you develop that budget to make sure that we get this project off. I will mention right. that to my chief of staff and mm -hmm. um, to uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer Weprin, uh, who runs uh, the farm. It's it's an amazing place, and it gets over 400,000 visitors mm -hmm. a year. Thank you. Thank you, somebody back there. Um, it's one of the most visited culturals in the city and over 130,000 school children a year. We just had the... Uh, the Queens County Fair there, over 16,000 visitors this weekend. So um, and if you haven't gotten to the Maze Maze, you can still still time. Yeah. Uh, sponsored by sponsored yeah. by a utility that I don't want to mention. <laughs> 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 All right, I am going to, uh, unless the uh, council re uh, tells me otherwise, I'm going to release the uh, panel. It's okay? We're all, Alexa Hente, you smiled over there? Or, okay. <laughs> all right, we're going to uh, thank you, and uh, please give our regards to uh, Commissioner Grillo. And um, I thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are apparently nobody else waiting to testify. What? No. Okay. All right. Um, then I'm going to close this hearing on behalf of my colleague and chair, Vanessa Gibson. I thank you all for being here today. And this thing was closed, let's say, 1130. Have a wonderful day.